So the question that we decided to, for today's session was that we have a 50 year old female who's presenting with blisters on trunk, arms and thighs. Now the blisters are typically developing on an itchy red base and rupture in few days to leave a hemorrhagic base. Now we have given you a clinical picture and direct immunofluorescence image of a patient. So this is the clinical image where we are seeing the blisters which are happening and they're healing leaving behind a hemorrhagic base and here is the DIF image which is showing some immunofluorescence finding. So based on this clinical image and DIF image, there are some options that have been given to you and you have to tell us what is the incorrect option from the based on the uh, condition which you will diagnose. So the options that are there with us is mucosal involvement may be present. Biopsy typically shows row of tombstone appearance. Nikolsky sign will be negative and treatment options include steroid and Dapson. So as you can understand, we are talking here about blistering disorders and now in subsequent part, we'll clarify you how to diagnose and then mark the correct option. So Dr. Praveen, over to you to uh, for the basic histopathology. So uh, I hope that you might have thought of an answer here. Okay, And before you move to the further videos, try to make a diagnosis and try to mark an answer in your mind. Now before we move forward, let's talk about the first year anatomy and histology, the first year. Um, Ma'am, uh, we have seen that the students when they move to the first year um, MBBS, probably the most important path is histology, histology, but that is where they lack the most. Lack the most, yes. So let's start and from there because that is the most basic thing in any MBBS career and uh, learning histology is fun, isn't it? Yeah, and even uh, like so talking about dermatology as we and me and Dr. Praveen were discussing, dermatopathology is the most important part. So if you can understand the basics of dermatopathology, I'm sure that you would be able to crack most of the dermatopathology questions because this is the only investigation we use in dermatology, which is pathology. Yes. So, okay, uh, let's start with the layers of the epidermis. Now, if you look at these layers, um, you will always notice that there are stratum corneum layer. That is the topmost layer. It basically has a keratinization there. And then comes the stratum granulosum. You know why it is called granulosum? Because if you look clearly, they will have some granules here. These are granules here. Okay. And it hence is called stratum granulosum. Below them is a stratum spinosum. A very interesting fact is spinosum has the word come from spinous process. And all the spinous process in the spinosum actually are what? They are the cadrans. They are the junctions which holds the two cells together. So for example, if these two cells are together and if I hold them together, I have to put my two fingers together. I, okay, I can hold it. So these all holding together appears as spinous process. And from that, the word has come as stratum spinosum. Okay, then comes the stratum basal layer. This is a stratum basal layer. Okay, and then there's a dermal papilla. Well, this is called as retiridus. Okay, so often I have seen students getting confused. Sir, how to remember the layers, which is top, which is below. Remember, G comes before S, so G upper, hai, the G is top, and S is below that. Okay, stratum granulosum and then the stratum uh, spinosum. Now, I told you, spinosum layer has the cells connected together with the help of cadrans. Have you ever seen a cadran? Cadrin is just a desmosome, okay? It's a protein of desmosome which holds the cells together. Yeah, the epidermis junctions. So I have brought this layer to make you understand. Let's, let's wait, understand, suppose this is a cell, it's a epidermal cell, and you are trying to pull all the edges all in a separate direction, and these all separate direction would be by the other cells. That means if I put the cells here, if I put one more cell here, if I put one more cell here, if I put more more cell, so all these cells will be connected to each other by the spinous process, right? But let's assume the spinous process is lost. So what will happen? That this entire thing is gone, and because stretching effect is gone, the entire cell becomes this round cell called as, I hope you are all guessing it correctly, it is called as acantholytic cell. Because those pulling effect is gone, it becomes a round cell here. So this is called as acantho, this is called as acantholytic cell. Okay. So that is what is called as acantholysis or called as loss of desmosome, loss of cadrans, whatever you want to name it. Cadrans are made of proteins called as desmoglines, which I'm very sure will be the hero of our today's discussion. Isn't yeah. it? Desmoglines. Sure. Sure. Let's understand the antibody uh, being arranged in these layers. The layers are having desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3. 
Now, again, let's try to recollect the layers, gornium, granulosum, spinosum, basal. You know? Now, from top to bottom, the layers have the presence of the desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3. So, desmoglein 1, 1 comes before 3. So, 1 is at the top and 3 is before that. So, 1 is majorly getting expressed on the upper surface, decreasing in the lower area, where desmoglein 3 is most in the lower area, decreasing in the upper area. So, this is desmoglein 1, this is desmoglein 3. Let's assume there is a type 2 hypersensitivity in a patient. So I hope you remember type 2. Type 2 hypersensitivity reaction is a condition where the B cells of the antibodies are produced against a fixed antigen. Fixed antigen. Remember fixed antigen? So suppose the antibodies are formed against a fixed antigen. Here, these are antibodies. What will happen? All those desmogleins will be broken off. And that is when the cell shows acantholysis. And that is when the shit shows bleaching disorders, which will be a clinical presentation, will be discussed by Dr. Kushbu in the next slides. But understand, once the cells are actually having destroyed by the antibodies, those cells lose the connections and the various types of lose uh, the change in the cohesive forces. If the antibodies are formed mostly in the upper area, so the upper area will separate, okay? And where is the upper area? The upper area has DSG1. So when the antibody forms against DSG1, the splitting mostly is in the upper zones, right? But suppose the antibody forms most in the desmoglein 3 and where is the desmoglein mostly? In the lower part. So if antibody forms here, the lower part will split off and therefore we'll say it is supra basal split. Now, I'm talking about desmoglein right now. I have not even talked about something which is in the dermal and in the lower areas. So right now we're discussing about the DSG1 and DSG3. Okay. So I would just like to add one thing huh. here uh, that... So, as uh, Dr. Praveen was telling you, so this, why do we get like desmoglein 1 is lower here? This is also called as desmoglein compensation theory. So, in the lower layers, the desmoglein 3 will compensate for the function of desmoglein 1. So, when we have antibodies against desmoglein 1, which is happening in pemphigus foliaceous, my upper layers will be affected. Whereas, when I have antibodies against desmoglein 3, which is happening in vulgaris, my lower layers will be affected. And now this thing kinds of reverses in mucosa, Dr. Okay. Yeah. So in mucosa, what happens is I have desmoglein 1, which is present only in the lower layers. So desmoglein 3 there is present throughout. Mm -hmm. So now in pemphigus, when we are talking about vulgaris, so if desmoglein 3 is involved in mucosa, so definitely I'll have mucosal involvement because nobody is compensating there. Whereas if there is just desmoglein 1 involvement, which happens in foliaceous, so there my desmoglein 3 compensates and that is why in foliaceous I will not get mucosal involvement. So this is a very, very important slide, yes, yes. I think, which if you understand, you would be able to understand most of the blistering disorder. That's a very important point about the mucosal involvement and why does it occur and why does it occur in the pemphigus cases. Uh, moving ahead. Uh, so, this is the type of split. We will talk about this in a separate video altogether. Sorry, separate uh, slides altogether. But understand that when the, this was corneum, right? And I hope you remember stratum corneum, then granulosum, then spinosum, right? So, if the splitting is just below the corneum, we have to call this subcorneal split, right? Now, if the splitting is occurring just above the basal layer, you have to call this supra basal splitting. But suppose the antibody is not formed against the smogleins, but is formed against something else. Now, what is that something else? So, suppose this is epidermis or this is dermis. Now, do you know how are they attached together? They are attached together by a collagen 7 attaching to the BPAG1 and BPAG2. Now, just imagine the antibody is not formed against the desmoglein, but is formed against the BPAG1 and BPAG2. Then what will split? Epidermis will split to the dermis. So that is when this type of splitting will occur and is called as sub epidermal. It's called as sub epidermal splitting. Now I hope understanding this thing will be very very important because once Dr. Kushbu takes you to the journey of the entire pathophysiology, clinical features and the treatment process, you have to keep these things in mind. So ensure you watch this part correctly and then watch the next part.